Okay. So dealing with distracted thoughts, just looking at the schedule, and I'm already half an hour late, which reminds me I should probably occurred to me I should check my emails. Maybe I should check my Facebook. Where's my phone? Oh, there it is. Okay, good. So have you seen the news today? So, okay, a, a little bit obvious perhaps, but, but who am I? <laughs> All of us, right? This is, this is how we've been training our mind, right? And every day we are distracted by countless things, right? And actually watching people using their phones is a really instructive way to see the mind, <laughs> how the mind works. And it's important to acknowledge that this is part of your spiritual practice. We, we can't just say, okay, it's Sunday, I'm going to go down to the Mahavihara and Bhante Kalako is going to tell me how to control my crazy mind. And then spend the rest of the week <laughs> or the rest of your life just living as if you don't have any training, you don't have any discipline, you don't have any skills or wisdom. So we actually need to see how we are training our mind outside of the meditation session so that we work on our mind and when it comes to sit, we have some skills, we have some insights, we have some habits that will help us in our meditation. And so it means that we need mindfulness in daily life, right? Essentially, this is what we need. We need to be aware of what we're doing, the purpose of what we're doing, the suitability of what we're doing, and the, the consequences of what we're doing. Because our thoughts, they, they add up right? Our actions, they add up. Our speech also adds up. All of this stuff adds up to this blob of stuff happening. This process and the way that we behave in the world, this is spiritual right? The way that we think is also part of our spiritual practice. The way that we meditate, sure, that's obvious to see this is part of our spiritual practice. But it's a mistake to think that somehow our meditation is going to solve all our problems in our life. That somehow meditation is going to solve my mind. It will help, but it's just one hour a week or 10 minutes a day or one day of practice per month or whatever. I mean, really, you've got to put things into perspective, right? You can't expect a lot from a little. And so we do need to understand what's going on with our mind is influenced by our activities that we do during the day. 
So that is to say that all the things that we do, we bring with us onto the cushion. And that's why it's uncomfortable to look at our mind. That's why there's so much going on. Because our lives are busy. That's why your mind is busy. Our lives are full of distractions. That's why your mind is distracted. This is the habit of our mind. And so this is what we see when we sit. We see the habit. Actually, we don't tend to see that this is a habit. We, we just see the results of that habit, right? The, the passing. We don't really identify it. Oh, this is the habit pattern of my mind. Like, if we do identify it as such, that's the beginning of wisdom and we can come out of it. But usually it's just like, this stuff is happening to me. Why is it happening to me? And you look around, everyone else is so perfectly still and quiet. And you think, I'm the only one. And, and so, the reason for this is that we live in a world full of sense desires. And our experience of the world is one of sensory experience. That's how we interact in the world around us, right? And so, all of our pleasures are sensory. What kind of pleasures do we have? Dare I ask? <laughs> okay, listening to music. Um, food. Right? Am I right? Yes. Netflix. Um, sun baking, going for a walk, makeup, night clubbing, um, working on the car, all sorts of things. These are ways that we find pleasure in the world, right? We're always looking for some pleasure in the world. We don't like discomfort, we don't like pain, we don't like suffering. These are things we are not looking for in the world. These are things that we run away from. And so we, we spend our entire lives actually bouncing between these two things. So it's important to acknowledge firstly that the search for pleasure is linked to suffering. So that means that when we feel uncomfortable, sad, lonely, we want to change that. Where do we look? Outside of ourselves, we look for something that's going to give us a little bit of a hit of happiness. And that's understandable, really. This, this is, I mean, life is full of suffering. I mean, you want to look for some, a little glimmer of hope, right? Just a little. And we think, ah, if I just eat that sweet little green pancake thing that I had this morning, that will make me happy. We think, oh, if only I had that new dress, or if only I had that new phone, if only I had new, that's, that's where we look for happiness, right? And so we're actually always scrabbling around, searching for little hits of happiness. Even going into your phone and like looking for that little bell icon. Is, is there a new message? Is there a new notification for me? A little hit of happiness. Scrolling through, just a little hit of happiness. And soon, have you noticed that you just end up scrolling and there's no happiness there anymore, but you're stuck. I remember going to a monastery for the first time. No, 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 not the first time, sorry. The first time um, we're in, the, in the time of mobile phones and there's no reception in this forest monastery. 
And I just remember, so pitiful, <laughs> sitting there in my room, just scrolling. And you know how if you don't have reception, the phone just stays on the same page, like, you know, over and over and over again, <laughs> the same page, the same news. <laughs> and it took me a long time to break that habit. So I don't think that we should feel like particularly bad, uh, you know, about technology. Like it's not technology's fault, right? And you know, in the past, there was plenty of people uh, who were distracted with things like newspapers or books or whatever task you know they turned their minds to. And even at the time of the Buddha. This was also the case, that people would find themselves some sort of distraction. And in the list of um, things about entertainments that the Buddha advises people to not engage in on the Uposita days, on the days uh, where people might observe eight precepts, one of which is avoiding entertainment, those lists are full of like fun stuff that even we, if we were desperate and had no mobile phone, we would also do. Like playing clapping games or going to picture shows or um, uh, imitating animals with our voices. And what else is there? All sorts of games and gambling, all sorts of things. And we would do this too, right, if we, if we didn't have our phones, if we didn't have technology. We would look for a way. We'd find a way. We'd do something. We'd distract ourselves somehow. You know, even in prison cells, you see people like you know, scratching on the wall, right? Or often I see in, in meditation centers, forest monasteries, that people have become so bored <laughs> that they start stacking stones just for something to do. And so this searching for activity, this is sense desire, sensory desire. And this is the opposite of nekkama, the opposite of renunciation. So renunciation is what we do when we voluntarily voluntarily give up sensory pleasures. So that's what you've done today, right? You've, you've done this. You've voluntarily given up all of those exciting things that I mentioned this morning that you could be doing. And maybe you're starting to regret it. I don't know. But actually, you're training the mind in a different way to how you'd usually train your mind. And that is by letting go. So when we do this, an image to help you is the image of a little tortoise. So this is an image that the Buddha used. He used this image of a little tortoise and, you know, tortoise has a head, I'm going to call them arms, two arms, no, four, four legs and a tail. So that's a total of six, right? Head, one, two, three, four, tail. Six, six little openings in its shell. And so this little tortoise, when the jackal comes, to eat it, just goes, tucks itself inside its little shell. So on a day like this, where we are practicing renunciation, we're like that little tortoise, tucked inside our little shell. And that hungry jackal can't get at us. 
will only reap suffering and disappointment. So these six openings are, of course, the six um, sense spaces. So our five senses, which are eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin, touch, and the mind being the sixth one. So these are the, like those six openings on that tortoise. And so when we are practicing meditation, practicing renunciation, going on a retreat, one of our jobs is to tuck ourselves inside our little shell so that the jackal can't grab on to one of our little sense consciousnesses, sense bases, and I guess pull us out of the shell or something or snap it off. So this is the way that we can think about our practice of renunciation, our practice of meditation. For this time, this is why I said at the beginning, for this time, just be here, be now. Don't go out there. Be here. And so in this way, we limit the input on our senses, right? In this way, we limit the activity of the mind so that already we're starting to withdraw from that world of sensory pleasures. We're starting to move away from its influence a little bit. So this is a training, right? Just that much is so much already. We've started to cut off all of that activity and we're starting to see what it's like to withdraw. And then you close your eyes and you sit in meditation. Closing the eyes alone is a really powerful practice, right? In our world, there is so much stuff coming at us all the time. And so just closing our eyes is a way that we can practice overcoming some of this sensory stimulation. And you're sitting still, you're not busy with the body, you're not doing things. Maybe there's a little bit of sound that your ears are kind of starting to tune out some of that stuff. It's nothing to eat in meditation. From time to time there's some smells, but we can deal with it. And then there's just the mind <laughs> that we've got left to deal with. So, we find ourselves withdrawing from the world. And this becomes a practice that we can do. And we become more comfortable and more familiar with this idea of stepping back. The secret ingredient, of course, is going to be time. Time away from that busy world outside. Time to practice. And time for those habit patterns that we've gotten stuck in to start to fade away and recede, to start to unwind a little bit. And this is something that I, I wish people had more of. I wish you had more time. I remember my, my friend saying once to me, oh, but you have so much more time than me. And I said, no, I don't. I have exactly the same amount of time as you. But I use it differently. And time is essential. It's like this secret ingredient in our practice. If you allow yourself some time, then you will see the change happening in your mind. If you allow yourself some time, 
you will start to undo that pattern of behavior that you've been engaged with in the world. So time, kanti, patient endurance. It's one thing to give yourself that hour to meditate, right? It's another thing to sit there for the whole hour. <laughs> so you need the time and then you need to, to sit in that time and to have patience with what goes on. And then when you do that, you'll see that things start to change and those tendencies towards impulse and movement start to fade away. And then perhaps you'll see that there's some peace in the mind. Just a few moments, maybe even half a, half a second. But if you see it, you can recognize it as being quite different to when the mind is distracted. And so I feel quite sorry for people if they never get the time to practice in a, an intensive way. Um, have most of you done a retreat? Yeah, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months is good, right? And then when you do this, you actually get the opportunity to understand more about the potential of your mind to be trained and to come out of its habitual conditioned behavior and to cultivate new ways of being that create a lot of clarity in the mind that give rise to huge amounts of joy, happiness and bliss that you simply cannot experience if you are busy, distracted, overstimulated, and indulging in sensory pleasures all the time. So those benefits of meditation rely upon nekkama, upon renunciation. This is how we get that understanding of how the mind works. This is why the Buddha said that it's so important to practice renunciation as part of our meditation practice. Otherwise, if we just think that we can keep on doing the same things, indulging uh, all of our activities and going out all the time and doing this, doing that, being overstimulated, then when we come to sit, it's really hard and we suffer. We don't like it, so we stop. <laughs> and then we go back to thinking those things will make us happy. Then we suffer and we want some peace, so we come and meditate. And then we find we can't, so we, we stop, we go looking for something else. And so renunciation is, is an essential part of our practice. And then there's different kinds of thoughts. So one important strategy that I find really powerful for me personally, and I know that it, it helps other people, and was recommended by the Buddha, is to contemplate, to reflect. This is thinking, and it's okay, it's allowable. <laughs> Isn't that good? Buddha was like, okay, your minds, let's see if you can work with that busy thinking mind and contemplate. So we don't have to have this pristine, silent, totally thought absent mind. It's going to be impossible for us to, to gain that in our daily practice if we're busy in life anyway. It will come. It does come. But you need time. And you need renunciation. And so when we when we contemplate, when we reflect, we are using the kind of mind that likes to think, that likes to ruminate, ponder, chat amongst ourselves with. We use that mind 
but we use it to contemplate something important and profound, something that will be instructive and useful to us on our spiritual path. So this is already a great change for us, because usually the contents of our minds are not terribly profound, <laughs> right? I mean, you've seen just today the stuff that's come up in your mind. Oh, it's so boring, right? It's so uninspiring. If you had to write it down, do you think people would want to read it? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Some people do write their, their, um, their meditation down. They kind of like are constantly scribbling away. And so obviously they're, they're not getting much um, depth to their practice. But when we contemplate, we're, we're able to work with the mind until it gets to a certain point where we can let that contemplation go and we have peace. So the kind of contemplations I'm thinking about are things like the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, Anusatis. These are the chanting that we do often at the beginning of our practice. These are Anusatis. This is, means to reflect again on... To, the sati means mindfulness. Anusati means to go back to, to reflect on, to recollect. And so we do this in a way that inspires the mind. Like we, we, we chant these things, but do we actually think about them? So we can spend some time at the beginning of our session thinking about the qualities of the Buddha, thinking about the qualities of the Dharma or Sangha. Or we practice Chaganusati. Chaganusati is the recollection of our generosity. So we think about the times that we've been kind and generous, and it inspires the mind. I mentioned already Sila Nusati, where we uh, recollect our, gener uh, our ethical conduct. Other kinds of recollections the Buddha recommended are things like death. Um, we can also do reflections on the five frequent reflections of old age, sickness, death, separation, karma. We can contemplate the four elements. So these are all things that the Buddha actually taught and recommended. And they're useful strategies for us. We can work with a mind that likes to think. And then, after a while, you see that the mind becomes tired of that and still is looking for some peace. But we've used our mind in a wholesome way, perhaps at the beginning of our practice or sometimes the whole session. We've used our mind in a wholesome way and that allows for those, those thoughts to at least be good thoughts, right? Because there are different kinds of thoughts, different qualities of thoughts. And if we're going to be thinking, if we're going to be distracted, if we're going to be talking to ourselves, we may as well talk to ourselves about the Dhamma. We may as well think about the Dhamma, right? So I'm not saying and please don't get the wrong idea, I'm not saying that this should be your exclusive practice. I'm not saying, don't go away from here and say, well, Bhante Kalika has just said that I can talk to myself the entire time. No, I'm saying, if you're distracted, if you're coming from a busy day, this is one strategy, especially at the beginning of your practice, that will help the mind to settle. So you've already done a lot by deciding to come and meditate. In your life, after work, you do some meditation. You've already done a lot just deciding to meditate. So you, you want to make the most of it. So we inspire the mind with something wholesome, something positive that brings joy into the heart. And when you have that joy after reflecting upon your generosity or reflecting upon your ethical conduct or being inspired by the Buddha, Dharma or Sangha, when you have that joy then it's easy to sit. When you have that joy and inspiration, you don't have to force yourself to stay. When you have that joy and happiness, 
that comes from reflecting upon these beautiful, profound things. You're inspired to practice. And the mind has already moved so far away from the kind of mind that you took into that practice. And then the Buddha said, just, you've done what you, what you wanted to do. You've done what you set your mind to, to inspire the mind and bring joy. And now I'm going to go and allow my mind to settle into peace and samadhi. So the Buddha actually talked like this. He said, do this and then go into samadhi. And so it's much easier, you'll find, if you, if you begin your practice in a wholesome, uplifting way. The rest of the practice tends to go quite well. However, you'll still find that some things come up, right? Sometimes it can be like this kind of soup that's just stewing under the surface. Do you know what I mean? You can be quite calm and quite clear, but there's still some like little waves and you're aware of them, but you're learning. You're not getting involved in the same way that you might have before. It's receding. It's going into the background more and more. Sometimes, though, things will come up. So we're still going to need some strategies to deal with them. So it's easy to say, let it go. It's really hard to do. And so we do need some strategies to help us. It's comforting for me to know that this was also the case at the time of the Buddha, that people also had minds like ours. Isn't that great? <laughs> Doesn't it make you feel better to know this? At the time of the Buddha, the Buddha also had people say, how do I work with my mind? My mind is so distracted. We're just the same. So not only do we have the same problems, but we've also got the same potential. And so if we have some strategies taught by the Buddha, then we can perhaps start to move away from that suffering and closer and closer to the goal of our meditation and our spiritual practice. So he actually gave, the Buddha actually gave a, a series of images in, the, uh, in the, the sutta on how to subdue distracting thoughts. So there's a whole sutta, a whole teaching by the Buddha about how to reduce these distracting thoughts. The Vitaka Sampana Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya 20? Majjhima Nikaya 20 or 19? One of the two. And in this sutta, the Buddha gives five um, similes on how we can work with distracting thoughts. And so I'll go through, I might not get to all of them, but I'll try to get to some of them at least. So the first is called the substitution method. The image that the Buddha uses is the image of a old wooden peg that's used in construction. So in the old days, they didn't have um, like metal nails and things for building. And sometimes you see some of these beautiful old Chinese temples. Um, they still don't use any nails, right? They just use joints. And sometimes they use like a wooden peg, like a, a peg that kind of unites these two pieces of wood. So from time to time, this peg might become rotten and old. And so how do you get it out? Well, the Buddha said, you use a new peg and you just hammer it through. So you use the old peg, oh, wait here, perfect. And you, and the other one pops out the other side. So the Buddha, he was so good with these kind of images. It's like, ah, oh, yes, this is the substitution method. 
And so when it comes to having distracting thoughts, what is the substitution method? Instead of thinking and getting involved in those distracting thoughts, we substitute something in our mind, such as the breath. The breath is a substitution method. Instead of just sitting with those thoughts, we transfer our awareness to the breath coming in, the breath going out. And in this way, we subdue the distracting thoughts. Right? Have you noticed this in your own practice? When you breathe in, you're aware. Sometimes you can be aware of the whole breath. <laughs> Sometimes you'll be aware of half of the breath. Sometimes if you're lucky, you'll be aware when you breathe out. And then you breathe in. So if you can manage to maintain that awareness, there's not much room for the mind to go, right? If you can substitute your awareness with the breath, it's hard for the mind to go and get distracted. The problem is, of course, that we're still in this thinking mode, so quite often our mind is so distracted that we can't substitute the breath successfully. But then over time, it becomes easier and easier. Have you noticed this too? If you have an hour or two or three, a day of practice like this or a retreat, have you seen how when you pay attention to the breath, the thoughts subside? Have you seen that? So we know, right? Ah, this is one way that I can deal with distracting thoughts by watching the breath. Again, expectation management, it takes time. It takes time for the breath to become, uh, for us to become mindful enough of the breath that we can sustain our awareness on it. But that is the training. That is the process. And that will be the result, that we'll have this awareness of the breath that can become extremely profound, right? And then we're like, wow, the breath is so beautiful. The breath is so amazing. The breath does so many things. My mind has become so clear, so bright, so powerful and strong. And the reason that it's done that is because you've trained the mind on the breath and those distracting thoughts have subsided to the extent that they're no longer draining the mind of energy. They're no longer sucking away the power and momentum of your meditation. They're no longer pulling you from your stillness. And when those distracting thoughts have gone, that's when your meditation really starts to take off, right? So this is how we train the mind by substituting the breath for those distracting thoughts. So that's the first one. Substitution. The image is the peg being hammered through by a new, the old peg being hammered through by a new peg. Then the second simile the Buddha uses is the simile of <laughs> a corpse or a, a chain of bones or a skeleton of an animal or a dog or something hung around your neck. It's quite, a, quite an intense image. So it's like a skeleton necklace. And this is designed to bring up a sense of horror and shame. So perhaps some of you have quite harmful thoughts of hurting another person. Or like, um, I remember once I was with a friend on a meditation retreat and afterwards I was chatting with her and I said, oh, you look so peaceful and so serene for that last meditation session. And I said, you didn't move. And she said, I was having sexual fantasies the whole time. <laughs> I was like, oh. And so, this kind of thing, of course, is not very useful for meditation, right? And 
we don't have to shame like sexuality. I mean, you could be thinking about chocolate cake the whole time, right? Or uh, whatever it is. Like, imagine if when you were sitting here meditating, around your neck appeared your thought, right? And I could see, oh, she's thinking about chocolate cake again. Oh, she's thinking about that. Oh, he's thinking about this thing. Imagine if others could see our thoughts. Wouldn't it be horrible? So this is, this is the image that the Buddha gives us, this idea of something horrible around our neck or something um, repulsive or unattractive. And so when we, we think like this, we should abandon that thought, right? We should let it go. If you're having thoughts of hurting someone, you should have a sense of shame come up. A sense of not wanting it, being repul repulsed by it. And that should help you let it go. So this is for those kinds of thoughts where maybe they're not very skillful and they're not the kind of thoughts that we want to have in our mind. So can you see the difference between those kinds of thoughts and the kinds of thoughts that I mentioned before, those wholesome recollections of the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha? Can you see why that's an effective strategy? Can you see why those kinds of thoughts that I just mentioned, those unwholesome, unhelpful, unskillful thoughts, why we'd want to let them go? And so, this, this kind of sense of shame, or hiri otapa, conscientiousness and prudence is a good way to look at it. These thoughts do not go anywhere. They do not help us, they do not help others, they obstruct wisdom, they cause vexation, and they do not lead to nibbana. And so knowing this, we let them go. So this is one way that we can practice, right, with those distracting thoughts. So this means that we don't just let these things happen to us. We're actively engaged. And we're only actively engaged because we haven't got the peace that comes from that substitution method. If we dealt with them at that stage, we'd have peace. But these thoughts have come up stronger, more powerful. So we need another strategy, and that's to imagine them like around our neck, like a like the body of a, a skeleton or something like that. Well, yeah, it's uncomfortable, right? Yeah. And then the third, if that method has not been successful. The third method is just to ignore it. Right? Just, and the Buddha says, just as a person... Um, who is blind would ignore the person sitting over there. You close your eyes, you can't see them, <laughs> right? And so this is how we do it. We don't see it. We refuse to look at it. We shut our eyes to it. So these are for those kinds of thoughts that are really starting to become a problem the kind of distracting thought that maybe is leading somewhere harmful, like wanting to hurt your colleague or, um, and I don't want to list too many things, <laughs> whatever it is that has become problematic in your mind and you think, actually, I really should not get involved in that thought. So again, you see that this is active, that we're not just letting these things happen to us. We're like, actually, I need to address this in my practice. And you only need to address it because that previous method didn't work, the substitution method didn't work, and now, for the sake of peace, to let go of those thoughts, okay, I just have to not look at it, not get engaged. And this is actually quite powerful because it's like, you tell yourself, stop. No. 
And sometimes we need to do that, right? And again, it's like this thing of like not picking it up. You don't pick it up. That's the, that's the difference. So this is that, that um, third method taught by the Buddha. The fourth is a beautiful simile that is really very powerful. The simile of a person walking fast. And that person is walking fast. And then they think to themselves, why, why am I walking fast? Why don't I just walk slowly? So they walk slowly. And then they think, why am I walking slowly? Why don't I just stand still? And so they stand still. And then they think, why am I stand why don't I sit down? So they sit down. And then they think, well, why am I sitting? Why don't I lie down? And so they lie down. So this is a simile for the sankharas, the mental activities of the mind, the things that kind of uh, churn, where we have will, intention, the activities of our mental processes. So we start, this, this, this method is actually starting to work more with wisdom, isn't it? Before we're using kind of like restraint, you know, which is kind of like, okay, no. But here we're kind of like, well, why is this happening to me? <laughs> why? Well, you're the one walking fast. <laughs> why are you walking fast? Why are you thinking so much about this thing? Why is it so sticky? Why is it stuck in your mind? Ask yourselves, where is this coming from? Inquire, investigate. But this is quite this is quite busy, right? This kind of strategy. You know, you have to you have to really look into what's going on in your mind to understand. Ah, if I want peace, I can't walk fast. I have to adopt successively more comfortable postures and let go of coarse postures. So you have to let go of the things that agitate the mind and move towards stillness and peace. And this is the way that you would deal with those thoughts. So this is that method recommended by the Buddha. The fifth method, the last method, only to be used in case of emergencies, right? So you can see that there's a, a, a method, a process at play here. First one, substitution, basic, easy, applicable all the time, anytime, right? Second one, kind of thought that, you know, that kind of shame, um, heriotopa, kind of thoughts maybe starting to become problematic. Third one, don't look. Like, we're really having to, to deal with this situation, cut it off. But fourth one, we need to investigate more to understand where, where peace lies. And then the fifth one is the simile of two men fighting. And so one strong man takes a weak man and forces him, like wrestles with him, and forces him down to submit, right? <laughs> grit, you grit your teeth, the Buddha says. You grit your teeth and you force that thought out. So this is extreme, right? This is a lot of effort. This is not something you should be doing every meditation session, right? You shouldn't be struggling with your mind in this way. This is for the kinds of thoughts that, have re that are really bad. You know, I'm going to kill that person. I'm going to do something stupid. You know, I want to steal that money from the, from the box. You know, these, these are the kinds of thoughts that are really bad for you and you're like, they become persistent and they just, you can't let go of them. You're going to have to work with your mind. You're going to have to overcome it. You're going to have to f draw down deep and find the strength inside yourself to combat that thought. 
but that's extreme, right? Only in case of emergencies. The best power, the best strength to develop is wisdom, to understand, ah, oh, this doesn't lead <laughs> to good results. And then all you have to do is let go. You don't need to wrestle with your mind. You're all smart people. We should understand this, right? We just don't get involved. We don't allow that thought to take over. And so this is why I say there's like some wisdom that we need to develop, but there's also some skills. And I want you to know, and perhaps you've already experienced this yourself in your own practice, that it is possible for those thoughts to subside. It is possible to get that peace. And that through training, we actually develop that ability over and over again through practice. And eventually it becomes almost like second nature. When you see the thought arising, as soon as you see it, you're like, hang on, and it disappears. You don't get involved. You've learned something. And then your mind is much more spacious. There's more peace. There's more strength, power, and clarity in your mind. And then your meditation has taken off already. You, just, you don't need to do anything. The mind is engaged on the meditation subject. There's no thoughts distracting you. You can just sit back and enjoy. And it's easy. So it's at that beginning of our practice where we don't have the training, we don't have the time, where we don't have the, the skills or the awareness. That's where we need to put a little bit of effort in. Getting onto the cushion is where we need to put a little bit of effort in, right? Otherwise, we're going to clean our house instead of meditating. Our house is going to be very clean, but our mind, not so clean. You know, we'll find any, so, any sort of distraction to not meditate. So even if you are meditating and you have really distracted thoughts, a really distracted mind, I think it's wonderful that you've done that much, that you're meditating and you can see them. Because this is the only way that you're going to understand why this is suffering. And this is the only way that you're going to learn. This is the only way that you'll find an escape. So this is a very short talk on dealing with distracted thought, distracting thoughts. If you would like to learn more, I'm actually giving a five-day retreat with the Maha Satipatthana Society of Klang. And are there still places available? There's still places available. So this is a good promo opportunity for me. And if you'd like to know more about that, you can ask my friend Terence here, um, because that whole retreat, I'm going to be looking at the monkey mind. Five days of investigating the monkey mind and how we can overcome that monkey mind. So if you're interested in that, um, I'd really, I think it would be a great opportunity if you get a chance to come along to that. So we've got a few minutes for questions, like 15 minutes. Does anyone have any questions? We'll have more opportunity later. And um, there's another question and answer session after lunch. So sometimes people are quite shy about asking questions. Comments? Criticisms? No? Well, then we'll have to do some more meditation <laughs> to take us towards, it looks like we're having a break from 10, oh, sorry, 11.30 till 1.30. And so we'll have lunch um, from 11.30, maybe a little break before lunch. 
and so then come back at 1.30, where it says on the schedule, question and answer session. So if you've got a question, please ask. And then we'll do some more meditation. I'm going to teach you some walking meditation. And then there's a chance for some interviews. So I guess there's a sign-up sheet somewhere, maybe. We can make one. And we'll have like 10 minute, um, 10 minute interviews. And so if you've got something about your practice that you want to ask, or a concern in your life that you want to talk to a monk about, try to keep it, if you can, relevant to the, the day's practice. Um, and then after that, we'll be doing some more meditation. Isn't that wonderful? And it says that we finish at five, but we can keep going. <laughs> People <are> like... <laughs> okay, let's do um, just ten minutes.